Um, so it's lovely to have you guys here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, when we put this day on, we haven't done a day like this for a, since before the pandemic, and I was not sure if anyone would turn up. So, I mean, about five minutes ago, I was really grateful if no one turned up, because then we could have all packed up and gone home and we wouldn't have to do it. But um, thank you so much for coming. So I'm Laura, and um, I was going to talk a little bit about um, health inequalities, kind of set the scene. Is that all right? Um, so bear with me. So um, I've been talking about and reading about health inequalities for 20-odd um, years. I think I've got some slides, hopefully, um, and, uh, which makes me feel quite old. <laughs> you want to say, no, not that old. But, but, um, and the sad thing is, is that in the 20 years that I've been talking about health inequalities, that unfortunately has got worse. So since um, Tudor Hart penned his um, definition of the inverse, um, inverse care law in 1974, we've had um, report after report after report describing health inequalities. And um, the most recent one, which was published, the 10 years of the Marmot Review, I don't know if any of you remember, but it was published a couple of days before um, COVID lockdown. And I went, bizarrely, in Parliament. I think everyone got COVID who went. <laughs> but, um, but it's okay, we weren't testing then, so we didn't know. Um, but, um, but we went to this kind of publication of this report that said health inequalities have got worse. And literally three days later, we went into lockdown. And COVID made them so much more worse, didn't it? And it really exposed our fault lines of health inequality. And so we're kind of coming out of that phase, aren't we? And for those of us who are on the front line, sometimes it can feel a bit overwhelming. <laughs> and sometimes it can feel unknown. But, so we thought today would be a good day just to gather. And we've got lots of different people presenting lots of different ideas. Um, some, most of them I've never heard before, so I'm really excited. And I'm really hoping that we genuinely learn is that all right? And we're quite a small group, so you can heckle and you can ask questions and you can kind of interact. Is that all right? Um, great. So for those of you who are um, new to health inequalities, oh, where do I have pointness? Are we going? No? Carry on. Okay. Um, so for those of you who are new to inequalities, there's some um, stonkingly good graphs to show them to you, if we can get the graphs up. If not, I'll really carry on. And the thing is, is that the way you measure health inequalities has got lots of technical definitions to it. I'm not a technician, for those of you who've realised. <laughs> I have a notebook and, some, and a biro. Um, so um, so that, the, the way we measure health inequalities, and the easiest way of measuring it seems to be kind of the average life expectancy or the age of death. And as you look at, um, as you look at them, um, that we, we have a lower life expectancy now than we had um, a couple of years ago. And if you live in areas of deprivation, so if you live in some of the poorest areas or you live in the richest areas, there's a gap of somewhere between 7 and 15 years, um, depending how you measure it. And that is true across um, all the country. So this is the national data. So you've got the most deprived there on, um, on the left and you've got the, mo and the least deprived on the right. And it's not really just about how long you live because it's also about how well you live. And what we know is that if you are um, living in an area of poverty and you, and you experience poverty, then you'll have more chronic diseases. Now, the NHS is great at counting chronic diseases. Just show you this. Um, oh, anyway, the NHS is great at counting chronic diseases, and we, we like counting them because... I don't know why we like counting them, really, but we like counting them. But we know that if you have four or more chronic diseases, that your quality of life significantly drops. And we know in areas of deprivation that people have four or more chronic diseases at... 20 years younger age. So we're talking about people kind of in their late 40s, early 50s, um, experiencing physical health of someone who's 20 years older. And that has massive impacts on work and family and, and prosperity, doesn't it? And this is felt actually on the front line. So those of you who are on the front line thinking, gosh, it's a bit knackering. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so this is the kind of um, consultation level required, this is the funding level required. And there is a gap between funding and our need. So if you're working in areas of deprivation, your funding doesn't quite match the need of your patients. And the Deep End team have done some brilliant publications on that. So um, today is about trying to find ways of reducing equality and equity. And this is the bit, this afternoon we're going to do some workshops, which we're really hoping you all actually like go for. Is that all right? Because I don't want to talk to myself on a workshop. <laughs> 
Um, so we're going to do some workshops together. We're having heard all the different speakers this morning. We're going to try and find ways that we can work together in PCNs and in our areas. And maybe if you've come on your own, then we'll find your friend. Don't worry, I'll be everyone's friend. Um, but we can think creatively about what we can do. There's a little bit of a window opportunity with PCNs at the moment, which I know for some of you will be in PCNs that feel like this is the dream of primary care was always meant to be. And for others, it may feel like this is a nightmare who invented this blinking system. And some of them are really functional and some of them are deeply dysfunctional, and it's tricky. But there is a massive opportunity with PCNs and the way the health service is reconfiguring to actually do something quite creative with health inequalities. So we're going to put our heads together and think about that. Is that okay? Um, and that's because we can change a lot. So this is some analysis that's done about how much, um, what percentage of health inequalities is made up from different things. And so even if we just sorted out healthcare, we'd sort out 20%, which is quite amazing. So those of you who are sitting here wondering about, oh my goodness, the coding for my EMU system is like well kaput. Like even if we got the coding sorted a bit better, we help the health inequalities. And then we start talking about health behaviours and physical stuff and the social economic factors. And actually you suddenly see that change is within our grasp. So some days it feels like change is completely impossible. But actually when you break it down, change is very much within our grasp. So for those of you who've heard me talk before, we, I always talk about a story. And um, for those of you who've... who've uh, before I've done like Harry Potter and Matilda and um, Duck in a Truck. <laughs> that was when my kids were small. I didn't read anything other than picture books. Um, and today I've picked a different story and I've picked one... Um, I picked one which is a really ancient story. So it's a story of a rabbi who has um, gone out for a walk. And when he goes out for a walk, it says that he meets a lady at a well who's a Samaritan. So it's quite a famous story. And I thought it'd be quite interesting just to learn from this story. All right to go with that. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. So you've got this rabbi and he goes out in the middle of the day and he meets this woman. And it's quite interesting because this woman is getting water from a well in the middle of the day. And the only reason this woman is getting water from a well in the middle of the day is because she's, like, outside of society. So she can't go in the morning when it's cool, and she can't go in the evening because everyone shunned her. She's there in the middle of the day. And the story goes on to tell us that she had five husbands. So if you were a Victorian, you'd have thought this woman was really wayward, wouldn't you? Oh, my goodness, she had no moral compass. She has five husbands. She has slept with the world. How awful. But if you read this story with modern eyes, what we now know is I think this woman is a woman who's probably had quite a lot of domestic abuse, who's been shunned, who's been abandoned, who's gone from one dysfunctional relationship to another dysfunctional relationship to another dysfunctional relationship. And um, how many of those women do we see in our care? So this rabbi who has status and is important and is holy sits and talks to this woman. And you see, when you read it, she goes, <laughs> she goes, oh my goodness, you're talking to me. And that's the first thing that happens. And so I want us to think today about who is on the edges. This Samaritan woman is from a different place, different culture, different rules. And quite often inequalities are about otherness. They're about people who sit slightly outside of our normal. Whether that's from their upbringing, their race, whether they're immigrants, whether they're people who've fallen out of our society through going to prison or probation, whether they're women who've ended up with very little choice apart from to use sex as their work. Health inequalities is often about otherness. And otherness is really uncomfortable. Otherness is really uncomfortable. But for us to get to grips with health inequalities, we all need to be like the rabbi and be willing to go and meet the other. So my first question for you today is, who is the other? The next thing that happens in the story is this rabbi says, can you get me a drink? And this woman goes, me? I mean, she's the only person sat there. <laughs> me? Oh, no, I can't get you a drink. You're far too important. And so my second thing about health inequalities is how can, create, how can we create spaces of mutuality? So quite often when we're talking about people who are um, other, we try and do to them. We create projects for them and then wonder why they don't turn up. We create smear mornings where all we want them to do is come for a smear but they're scared stiff and they feel ashamed because they've had five husbands and they think you can tell that from their cervix. 
So quite often we do things for, we, for people or to people out of good intention, but we don't do them mutually. And so today I want us to think about how do we use our systems in mutuality? How do we say, can you get me a drink? Can you do something to help me? Because it builds trust and it builds relationship and it creates this different space. And then it creates this moment of change. I think healthcare is phenomenal because it has moments of change built into 10-minute blocks. <laughs> I mean, it's quite relentless. But every consultation is an opportunity for a moment of change. Every time we contact a patient is an opportunity for a moment of change. And when we think about some of the psychology we're now learning about nudge theory and um, cycles of change and moments of change and how change can be inspired by trust, you suddenly realise that your morning surgery that might look round, actually on one level you have a whole load of EMIS alerts flagging up at you and then you've got a whole load of other stuff coming through. But actually each one can be a moment of change. It can be a moment of trust building. It can be a moment of compassion. Even if it's something really benign, it can be something that's quite special. And I fundamentally do believe that health is a massive pivot of change. And we're going to share later on some stories about change. I'm always amazed when I pull off the data. When we pull off the data for focus care, um, I'm amazed at how many people change. They get, you know, people get rehoused, people do give up drugs, people do change their diets. Diabetics actually do get their h one cs down again. The fact they're replaced by the next wave of over 100 <laughs> makes you see not see them. But they do. People really do change. And so healthcare is has these moments of change embedded in it. And the other thing about the story of the rabbi and the woman was it allows, it set conditions for change. And that's something that's, that's also we can do. So change can happen kind of randomly. And thankfully, we all have those moments where you're not the best clinician in the world, but somehow it still pans out. Yes. <laughs> but we also have conditions for change. And some of these conditions will be things that we need to press into more. You know, who are the others? How do we find them? What's their story? What are systemic factors going on that are actually help, um, hindering people at the moment? And there's a lot of them. <laughs> there's a lot of them. And the other thing that I really love about the story of the rabbi and the lady, the Samaritan lady, is that it's not someone else's problem. It's very easy to say the Samaritans, well, everybody knew the Samaritans. They were disorganized. They had lots of poor. They were immoral. They, um, they could look after their own poor. It's a Samaritan problem. And what health inequality says is it's all of our problems. And in the public service, we're quite good sometimes at going, well, it's... It's interesting, that problem is definitely a public health problem. It's interesting, that problem is definitely a primary care problem. It's definitely gastroenterology. If there was a proper consultant who saw a clinic, it would all be fine. It's definitely third sector. Or my favourite one, which I do do quite a lot in my head, is definitely Boris. <laughs> Get rid of Boris, everything will be fine. And of course, all those are shortcuts, aren't they? And it's not true. And the thing about tackling health inequalities is that it's all of our problems. We all have to solve it together. We all have to be passionate about it. And we all have to be curious beyond our professional boundaries. I am not a public health expert. I have done zero training in public health. I have found the public health lectures at uni desperately dull. I spend most of my life in public health. Um, because that's where my curiosity is and that's where I think change can be. And the final thing, just reminding of this story, is that it is a woman looking for a drink. And I think as we come into the cost of living crisis and as we come into next year, we might just have to be brave and say, it might actually all be about utilities. And utilities might really matter in the six months' time. We might actually be, have to be a group of people that passionately talk about fuel and electricity and water and things that we never thought we would be talking about in 2022, 23. We might have to be a group of professionals who stand up and say, I don't understand how people work out their tariffs for electricity, but I do know I've got patients that aren't turning the lights on. And we probably need to be saying those stories very loudly. And we need to be saying the stories of the people who choose not to have electricity connected at all. We're starting to see it in some of our patients. 
And I, this story just reminds me that actually it might also just be about water in six months' time. And that's okay. We don't shy away from that. We're going to be bold and tackle it. So this is just to finish off. There are some really positive things that happen. I don't want you to all feel despairing because I'm not. I'm full of hope. There's loads of stuff happening, and the, one of the most exciting things about this morning is you'll go and hear from all these people who are passionate about their areas of expertise, who are passionate about their projects, who are passionate about the work they've learnt, who've got some little secrets for us to gather in today. Is that all right? I love the idea of a trauma-informed dentist, whoever they are. Like, brilliant, wonderful. Don't we need more of them? <laughs> so learn, like, drink it up and be hopeful. And then this afternoon, hopefully, we're going to design together some things that we can do. And this is one of my favourite quotes, and it says, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And sometimes, in inequalities, you have to have some damn perseverance. You have to have some perseverance, and you know it grows character. It grows character in us, it grows character in our teams, it grows character in our systems, it grows character in our relational networks that spread like tentacles and bring change. And character often leads us to hope. So thank you very much. I hope you have a really great day. And um, eat all the biscuits, drink all the coffee, and uh, talk to each other. Is that okay? Thank you. <laughs>